Uh, TV respects me. It laughs with me, not at me. <laughs> you stupid. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> Sadistic Penguin Studios presents Yumper and Svo at the Show Podcast with Tom Yumper Garcia. Have you paid your dues, Jack? Yes, sir. The check is in the mail. And Justin Svo Svoboda. What, so I gotta sit here and eat dessert alone like I'm fucking Steven Glansberg? It's almost time, so grab a drink. Get your popcorn ready and get comfortable to hear two guys from Chicago talking movies. Welcome, everyone, to season three of episode one of Yumper and Swole, the show. I'm one of your co-hosts, Tom Garcia, a.k.a. Yumper. I'm with my other co-host, Justin Swole Swoboda. Mrs. Hobara, we've made it to season three. We have made it to season three. It has been a long summer. I missed you immensely. Um, in the words of our buddy Sam, who's trying to get gay right now, you know? Definitely. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. The great Christopher Walken makes every moment magical. Uh, guys, we are so happy to come back. Uh, I know we've been on a hiatus. Spool did his baseball tour, and I actually took a break and started doing some stuff on the side that I hope you like with his way back playback. But we are right here and ready to talk some TV shows today. So switching it up a little different than what we usually do. I know we usually talk about movies, but we decided to add a little bit more uh, spice to our uh, show and get different avenues to see what you guys think. <laughs> Um, but, uh, so are you, I mean, are you excited about these TV show talks today, man? I mean, I know we, uh, we, we always ramble about our shows and want to pitch the shows to each other. Uh, how do you feel about today, man? I am. There's a, there's a couple in here that, um, one I started and I'm not going to say names cause I'm going to save that, but then other one that I'm really intrigued by, um, from your list. So I'm excited to talk TV. Like it's pretty cool. Yes. 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 So am I, I'm very intrigued by one of you in your list as well. Um, but let's get into what we actually have been watching this long break. So, uh, so we'll start us off with what you've been watching on your summer vacation. Man, dude, I, I feel like I spent as much time in the movie theater on my summer vacation as I did in baseball stadiums. Because we went, like, we were gone for 17 days and we did five ballparks. And I spent some time in the movie theater on the trip, like, the whole time. So, um, I think the first thing that we need to talk about, because I never got an answer from you, is uh, Oppenheimer. Um, I saw Oppenheimer three times so far. So I've spent nine hours of my life watching Christopher Nolan movies this summer. Um, I thought Oppenheimer was brilliant. I thought it was brilliantly shot. I thought it was brilliantly paced. Uh, Killian Murphy was fantastic. Everybody and their mother was in this movie. The cast was so extensive, uh, and it moved up to, like, probably top three Christopher Nolan movies for me. Um, that's how I felt about it. Yeah, I totally, uh, totally in conjunction, like agree with you there. I think Robert Downey Jr. stole the show. Uh, Killian Murphy, I think should be nominated for an Oscar. I think Robert Downey Jr. should also be nominated for Oscar for best supporting actor. Uh, his performance was excellent. Uh, it just shows his range as an actor and how people kind of now, since he's more, connected with the MCU kind of forget like how great of an actor he is. I mean, the man was nominated for a uh, Academy Award for a leading, leading actor in Chaplin. Um, and he has a real wide range of, uh, of, you know, versatility in his, his acting skills. So yeah, I, I enjoyed every minute of it. Jen was kind of um, a little bit like hesitant to see it because she's like, Oh, it's a long movie. I don't know. And she really enjoyed it. Uh, I think it was perfectly paced, perfectly done in terms of um, the cinematography was excellently done. Uh, the music that was added to it was great. Uh, Christopher Nolan just knocks it out of the ballpark. Uh, like one of our, not the best like director right now in this gener genre of movies that are coming out. Um, he's just hitting home runs every time he you know launches one out. So like, who else can make a three hour movie about like World War II drama into a summer blockbuster, right? Yeah. Um, the cast is so extensive: Casey Affleck, Matt Damon, Robert Downey Jr., Killian Murphy. Um, Benny Safdie, the, the, mm -hmm. one of the co-directors of uncut gems plays a pivotal role in this movie. Um, you have, um, Josh Hartnett, which you have is Josh, very surprising. Josh Hartnett was a complete surprise. You have, uh, Emily Blunt was in it. Florence Pugh, 
Uh, and Florence Pugh, I thought was fantastic. And I don't know if you caught it. Um, and I'm this, this might be a spoiler, but, but, uh, there's a scene where Florence Pugh character, like Oppenheimer is being cross-examined and Florence Pugh character dies and they, they think, or it's implied that it's suicide, mm-hmm. but, but it, it seems like pair, where somebody's pushing like, there's yeah, a pair of black hand, a pair of hands and black gloves where she's clearly being killed because she was a communist or a communist sympathizer. Um, and it might be the closest thing that we ever get to a Christopher Nolan horror movie. Um, <laughs> Cause it's not really like his thing, Yeah, but I just, man, it is a brilliant movie. I'm actually reading the book um, that it was based on right now, American Prometheus. Uh, and it's a really, really good movie. It's if you haven't seen it yet, you gotta go see this. I got a chance to see it in seventy mil seventy millimeter IMAX in San Francisco, uh, and it was an experience, like floor to ceiling screen. It was an experience. Yeah, you told me that you saw it in the theater. You showed me the picture. It looked like it was an amazing experience. Uh, it really, really was. If you guys haven't seen it. I highly recommend. It's a it's a long one, but it's totally worth the watch. It doesn't really feel like three hours. No, it doesn't. No. Um, I also saw Asteroid City, uh, Wes Anderson's new movie. Um, I like Wes Anderson movies. I think a lot of his movies are a little bit too existential for me, but um, this was a good, entertaining watch. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I saw Barbie. I thought Barbie was really, really well done. I know you didn't see it, Yump, um, Mm -hmm. but it was really, really good. I think Margot Robbie was fantastic in it. Ryan Gosling was really, really good. My favorite character in the movie was Michael Sarah, though. Michael Sarah <laughs> was really good in Barbie. Um, I saw Haunted Mansion. It, it is what it was. It was entertaining for an hour and a half when I wanted to get out of the 95 degree Los Angeles heat. Um, I saw Blue Beetle. Now, I text you when I got out of the theater about Blue Beetle. And I know Blue Beetle is not doing well at the box office, but this movie was actually pretty good. And let me tell you why I feel how I feel about this movie. It was really, really nice to see not some white born superhero movie. The It was Latina influenced throughout the whole thing. I know how you feel about George Lopez, um, but he was really, really good in this movie. Uh, the kid that's in Cobra Kai was the main character, and he was really, really good. This was a good movie that is not going to get the love that it deserved. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Yeah, and I've heard that from other people. My brother, for instance, saw it and said he really enjoyed it. Um, it's kind of sad because DC is not getting, you know, it's not going to be, hasn't been Marvel for a while and it's not going to be Marvel. Uh, I think the only big, you know, moneymaker for DC right now is Batman in terms of superheroes. Yeah. Um, and from what I heard, Blue Beetle is actually worth the watch. And for some reason, due to The Flash not making a lot of money, DC's kind of on like the, the mend right now. And it's unfortunate. Hopefully it doesn't, you know, um, deter them from making a sequel because I'm pretty sure they could make a sequel. And it's always nice to have uh, a different array of different types of characters that are, um, you know, of different nationalities and ethnicities. Representation to, matters. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I like what they're like, just like what Marvel's doing with the, with the um, Spider-Man movie. You know, I, I'll talk about that when I go to mine. But like, it's just different, you know, ethnicities. It shows that, you know, there's more different people out there which can relate to other people. Um so, you know, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing it. I haven't got around to it, but I definitely will check this one out. Yeah, I liked it. Um, I also saw Gran Turismo. Um, and, you know, I went into it because I have a list and I see all these movies. I don't I only pay like one subscription for it. I went into it and I was kind of like, eh, whatever. But it was actually pretty good. Like it was a fun watch. It was a nice way to tell a story about like a true story. Um, and I enjoyed it. So check that out. David Harbour from Stranger Things is in it. He's one of mm-hmm. the like the co-leads. He's really, really good. I saw Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. Um, and I, I don't, you know, have you seen it yet? No, we're actually going to take him, my son, probably uh, Labor Day to see it. I'm going to say this. This was the best animated movie of the summer. Like Spider-Verse was great and I loved it. I love Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. It was really fun. It was really good. The animation was crazy. Uh, they were actual teenagers in the movie, not just like, you know, mm-hmm. like the movies, like the, the live action movies made them feel like they were, you know, adults in turtle costumes. They were teenagers in this movie and they were going through things that normal teenagers go through. Um, not that I remember it because that was like 20 something years ago, but um, 30. really good movie. Highly recommend it. Good cast. And the last movie that I saw was Strays. Um, Strays was the weirdest movie that I've seen all summer. It is a, 
R-rated movie about talking dogs and they are humping shit and pissing on stuff. It was one of the weirdest movies I've ever seen. And there, there were some really pretty funny moments, though. Like, if you have an afternoon to kill on a Tuesday or a Wednesday when it's five bucks, six bucks, or like uh, whatever, it was $4 movies all weekend this week because it was National Cinema Week. Like, I would maybe see it, but um, it was weird. It was bizarre, my friend. Yeah, I see the kind of trend right now is like Hollywood. I think it started with the uh, Seth Rogen sausage party. Yes. They're trying to do like kid themed like movies, but making them adult. Yeah. So, so I think that's what Strays was. It looked okay from my son. I'm really looking forward for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, I know my son is really looking forward to it. Uh, Gran bet. Turismo, um, when you told me it was pretty decent, I started looking into it. And uh, it's not something that I, I put on my list for my list we can go to now, but uh, I watched um, Twisted Metal. And with the limited storyline on Peacock, I thought they did an actually good job of fleshing out characters that made it enjoyable. I mean, it's not the greatest show, but it was entertaining. Anthony Mackie's in it, right? Yes, yes. Anthony Mackie plays the uh, the lead character and the girl from, she's an Encanto too, but the girl from uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Um, ah, okay. She's uh, she's in it as well. Uh, and then you have uh, Samoa Joe for the wrestling fans who play Sweet Tooth and Will Arnett does the voice, who... Um, I think was like the best character in the show. I can do a review on it, but like, I think like the way that they're doing like writing now with small stories, like it's a bit based off a video game and like they did with Gran Turismo, which actually has a bigger backstory than this. I think they're doing a pretty good job of it. And I'd like to see how they, you know, branch out to other franchises um, going forward. Yeah. Uh, but I also saw this, you know, the spider, uh, Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse uh, really, really enjoyed it. My son loved it. It was very long, but we left us wanting more with the cliffhanger ending. Sorry if that's a spoiler alert, but uh, love the love the visuals of it, love the music in it. I think they're doing a really good job with uh, Miles Morales' character and the animation aspect of it. I am a little worried how they would transition it to live action, but which think, they will eventually. Yeah, they've already I, said they are. But I think right now they're doing a very good job and looking forward to the uh, newer um, one that comes out in a few years. Uh, and on top of that, I saw. Two horror movies in the same night. So the first one I saw was Nefarious, which uh, stars actually Sean Patrick Flattery, who we might know from Boondock Saints. Boondock and he's, Saints. Uh, he's also Powder. He plays Powder, the character, the character Powder. And it has uh, Jordan Belfi, who you would know as Adam Davies from Entourage. Uh, so basically the movie's about possession. It's basically a guy goes and sees a, a criminal who calls him, he's a psychiatrist, goes to see a criminal to see if he's sane to stand up for execution. And so it was actually made by a Christian group, which surprised me at the end. I thought it was really, me personally, I thought it was very, very well done. It was not a lot of jump scares or scary scenes. It was more creepy aspect, a more psychological aspect. Uh, Sean Patrick Flaherty played, I think, very well, a good, great role by switching from his two personalities of the demon and the person he possessed who had a really bad stutter. So he did a very good job uh, switching roles in there. And Jordan Bel- uh, Belfi did a pretty good role in his uh, job. From what I heard about people who've seen this movie, supposedly a real exorcist said that this movie was the closest thing he's ever seen to a real life personal possession. So take it what you will. It's not the greatest movie, but I enjoyed it. And then we finished off that night watching The Pope's Exorcist to me, and it was to me it was shitty. <laughs> so it was a it was a nice lighthearted night, huh? <laughs> yeah. I watched the Pope's Exorcist. Russell Crowe, great actor. This role, he plays an, an Italian uh, exorcist from the Vatican. This is actually based off the of true stories of this man. Uh, I forget his name. I think his father, Gabriel Armoth. Uh, basically, he goes in to his family that's in Spain and he uh, exercises their son. But the funny part is, like, the way he gets to Spain is on a little motorbike from Rome, which makes me laugh because Russell Crowe is like 300 pounds. Right. They show him riding this little motorbike. Um, I think it was out there. It wasn't really scary to me. Uh, I think Nefarious was better, even though this movie had more jump scares. But check them out and let me know what you think. Have you seen any of these movies as uh, well? These two? Uh, uh, n- not of these two. I saw The Pope's Exorcist on my list, but I didn't get mm-hmm. to watch it. Yeah, check it out. I mean, we're big horror movie fans. Yeah. Let me know what you think. My brother liked it. But I didn't like, I guess maybe because I watched Nefarious before it, I thought Nefarious has done better. But the post exorcist just, I, I kind of think like the exorcism movies are kind of played out in terms of like they try to call back to the original, like the OG exorcist. And I think it's not 
done correctly. Now they're coming out with a new one, and I'm not, yeah. you know, I'm not too happy about that either. Well, and David Gordon Green is doing it. Yeah, it's just the, gonna suck. Yeah, the person who destroyed Halloween. So the guy that single handedly destroyed my love of the Halloween yeah. franchise. But uh, I also watched a Scanner Darkly. Now, Scanner Darkly is shot in a very different aspect ratio of like it's kind of like animation, but live action. It's done very, very well. It has Rory Cochran in it, uh, Keanu Reeves, Winona Ryder, Robert Jr. Jr. is in the movie. It's basically about a cop who gets he gets addicted to a drug and his life changes. He doesn't know what's real and what isn't. Check that one out. Definitely worth watching. Have you seen this one? Yeah, it's a Richard Linklater movie, right? Yes. Very, yeah. Like, it's really enjoyable. Uh, another one I checked. <laughs> Lucky Spags said the Exorcist Pope wasn't that bad. I don't know, Spags. You like the new white man can't jump. (laughs) Uh, Maybe, Baloney. Who knows? Yeah. um, But uh, Brooklyn's Finest, I saw, was it to the next one. Uh, This one I haven't seen. I heard good things about. Uh, It was directed by the same guy who directed Training Day. It's actually quite, uh, you know, a good, well-rounded story. Uh, I loved it. Actually plays the opposite of what he does in Training Day, and Don Cheadle's undercover. Richard Gere plays a uh, actually a good moral cop um, who's basically been through a lot. The Ringer. I, I mean, he that one out. he visits hookers frequently, but he has yeah, morals. But, yeah, he does have morals in terms of, <laughs> but like he has issues going around where he wants you know to right. off himself. Uh, that was actually it was a long one, but it was actually enjoyable to watch. And then the last one I finally got in to watch the first Kingsman. Never seen any of the movies, decided to pop that one in. I was texting you during it. You were. It's, it's totally, uh, it's out there. It has uh, Samuel L. Jackson, Colin Firth, uh, Michael Caine, Mark Hamill's in the movie, um, Taron Egerton, who's the lead. It's basically like a more cooler, like updated um, James Bond. Like not as classy, but more funny and more com- comedic elements added to it. I think uh, that's the best way to describe it. Yeah, I really liked it a lot. Uh, I'm looking forward to watching the second one uh, when I have time. But yeah, that's all everything I watched this summer, man. We watched a lot of movies, man. I'm going to have to watch Pope's Exorcist. I have an hour and a half flight tomorrow morning at 8 Mm a.m. And I don't do well on flights. So I may download it to my phone and watch it on the flight. Yeah, I think it's like an hour and a half. It's, I mean, like, I know I gave Shane crap. It's not horrible, but I just didn't like it from switching from the fairies to that one. Yeah. But I mean... It's like, I think I said, it's like a kind of like Hollywood's doing the same, same thing in terms of trying to recreate the exorcist. And I'm like, eh. I think it happens every couple of years where they like, let's do a demonic possession movie. And then there's one after the other. And mm-hmm. then they go away for a little bit, but they always come back around. Yeah. And in this terms, it's more of a, it's supposed to be off the uh, father's experiences as he did over 2000 exorcism, the real person in real life. Um, and I think they could have, I think they would have, if they did a better backstory with him more focused on that instead of just focusing on this particular incident. Yeah. I think it would have been better. But what can you do? But with that, my man, let's um let's move on to our TV show list. Now we picked four a piece of shows that we like and we have one that we ultimately agree on that is our favorite TV show of all time. So Mr. Sobot, are you ready to get into this? I'm so ready, Yump. All right, let's get into our first one, my man. I think Bart and Lisa are feeling a little upset right now. Isn't there something you'd like to say? They're curious. Kids, you tried your best and you failed miserably. The lesson is never try. <laughs> right in the butt. <laughs> that was great. The Simpsons, that's been out since 1989, so it's been running for 35 seasons. Uh, the show stars Dan Castellano, Nancy Cartwright, Hank Azaria, Yearly Smith, and Harry Shearer. Um, this show has had 181 awards given to it, including 35 primetime Emmys and 352 nominations. This is one of my favorite shows of all time. Uh, I don't, to be honest, I don't watch it as frequently as I used to because it is in its 35th season and it does kind of turn a little sour because it's, I mean, it's dull. It's been going on for so long. But Simpsons was like a big thing for me when growing up, like even when Fox started putting out the reruns at 530 and then every Sunday night when you watched, you know, the Simpsons every at seven o'clock and you had, especially during Halloween time, Tree Horse, ha, ha, um, Tree House of Horror, you know, was something that was really big. You know, the way they were one of the first shows to actually pull in, you know, making fun of politics, making fun of social issues, 
you know, making fun of just the way things were going in America. They made fun of Fox, for God's sakes, every time. You know, they had their iconic characters from, you know, Mr. Burns to Krusty the Clown, who was based off uh, Bob Bell or, um, as we know, Bozo from Chicago. You know, uh, Barney Gamosa's lack, you know, just little things like that that's really drawn me into them uh, that made me really, you know, enjoy. And, and I still pop in, like, and watch a Simpsons episode here and there. You know, they're on Hulu now all the seasons. And they still crack me up. Even like, I mean, today when I was with the bums at the wrestling show I was watching, we were quoting uh, Simpsons quotes because they're so iconic and with history, you know? What do you think about it, Swell? So I'm like you. Like, I haven't watched it in a while or watch it regularly. I try to catch the Treehouse of Horror whenever it airs. Um, but, like, you can't deny the lasting impression that the Simpsons made on pop culture. Like, you quote it all the time. I quote it all the time. Um, no one understands sometimes when I'm, when I drop Simpsons references, not everybody does. And they're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, never mind. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't get it. But like it, it had such an effect on pop culture. Like Bart Simpson was everywhere when he first launched and everyone loved Bart when they realized, and then they didn't realize that Homer was the star of the show all along. Mm -hmm. Right. So funny, so quotable. And like, Absolutely has to be in top 10. Yeah, Shankster, good call. When they stab the uh, stake through Mr. Burns' crotch when he's a vampire. Dad, that's his crotch. Oh. Yeah, just look at kind of things there. You know, the, the my favorite one, one of my favorite scenes is when uh, Burns goes for his test and he goes up and down the escalator and he's like, I'm a big boy now. <laughs> like stuff like that. Like just so random. It's it's rather hilarious. You know, they have their ongoing gags. The intro always was different. Uh, yeah. Whenever they panned upstairs to the house, there's always something in between the floorboards, you know. Just like, you know, they, they're comic geniuses and the actors should be paid what, you know, what they're getting paid now. Uh, and you had great talent come through. Like Conan O'Brien was on the show. You know, Phil Hartman was a big part of it before he passed. You know, the... the yeah, the like the guest, pe like the guest that they brought in and then animated, like it's almost mm -hmm. like a badge of honor. Yeah, and uh, you know, yeah, I totally agree with you, Lucky Spag. Like it, to me, it it's the best animated series of all time. And Family Guy gets a lot of shit for copying The Simpsons. They even make fun of themselves for doing yeah. it. But you know, there's no Family Guy without The Simpsons. There's not, there's not a lot, lot of show animated shows that took risk. You know, Futurama, of course, is from Matt Groening, but those things, you know, that were actually gone after The Simpsons. They The Simpsons actually laid the groundwork for other shows to pop up like that. And I think that's uh. Why it's so iconic to me? Well, it took it took the normal family sitcom that you would get, right? Like, mm -hmm. and it made it animated, and it made it funny, and they could do things that a normal TV show couldn't because it's easier to draw than to spend that budget on actually doing those things. And Matt Groening's sense of humor was just like it was perfect for the time, and it really, really was. Yeah, and the thing that always got me as a kid was the, uh, Matt Groening. Spoiler revealed that. Springfield's actually in the um, West Coast. Oh, yeah, it's in Oregon. Yeah, I think. yeah, Oregon. When I always watched it, I always thought it was in Illinois because he would say Shelbyville. Shelbyville's in Illinois. Yeah. And they would say small things about references to the city, you know, the things around Illinois. So I always assumed it was Illinois. But he came out and said that. So I'm like, oh, so I was lied to. But um, that's one thing that was cool about the whole thing about Springfield not having a, you know, where is Springfield? Is it real or not? I remember they gave away from Mr. Burns was got shot. They gave away a contest to win a Simpsons house when nobody won it because nobody picked Maggie to be the shooter. Also, like there were odds in Vegas on who shot Mr. Burns. Like you could put money down on who shot Mr. Burns because it was wasn't that a season finale cliffhanger? Yeah. And they were like, Well, we don't know, but you could put you can bet on it. Like that's crazy to me. Uh, like, yeah, it was yeah. It was, a, I don't know, it's this iconic show. Uh, I loved it and I still love it, you know, quoting him, the older shows. So it's just, to me, I think it's kind of running on its, you know, it's last running thread. on fumes. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it's iconic for 35 seasons. Whatever show can say they went on for 35 seasons besides Sesame Street. Do you have, besides the, the family, right? Mm -hmm. Bart, Lisa, Maggie, Homer, and Marge, do you have a favorite Simpsons character? I have two. So okay. one of them is uh, only appeared in one episode, and that's Hank Scorpio. Okay. Homer's boss. Homer's and, boss, yeah. Yeah. And the second is Moses Lack, because okay. Hank Azaria is freaking hilarious. Uh, 
the way Mo is portrayed as like a loser and just the things he says, like when he goes to the school and the kids are making laughing at the names he's saying, and he's like, oh, I know. Is it because of my ears? My giant ears? <laughs> he like, has no so idea. Tiny. Yeah. Yeah. Just stuff like that. You know, the prank calls, um, the part when the rats run into the bar and he's like, all right, everybody tuck your pants into your <laughs> shoes, your socks, you know, stuff like just, you know, Mo to me was always been funny. I know there's so many other ones, but those are my two favorite ones. What about you? Uh, so yeah, I have a couple too. Um, one, I would say Ralph Wiggum, like Ralph Wiggum cracks me up. Um, every year on, uh, Valentine's day, I choo choo choose you. Um, and the other one is crusty, right? Cause crusty is just this fucking dumbass, egotistical jerk, but he's so funny. The other thing that I say all the time that my wife doesn't understand, she doesn't get it at all is when we park somewhere. And she's like, well, where do we park? And I go, we parked in the itchy lot. Like she doesn't <laughs> understand that reference at all. And I love it. We were, um, I was a kid and I was at great America with my buddy, Patrick. And we were at the top of, I think it was iron wolf. And it was right before the drop was about to hit. And you could see the parking lot in all of great America. And Patrick looks over at me and he goes, Remember, we parked in the itchy lot and like it's still to this day is one of my favorite lines that not a lot of people get unless you were like a fan of the show. Yeah, it's so iconic, man. It's just like so many good things about it. But uh, it's, I say the itchy lot every time. <laughs> Brandy, uh, yeah, I mean, it's so, like we still call cool things, you know, yeah. uh, put away that uh, put away that yellow sweater. <laughs> That's something that was like hardcore fans. I know like that one, like put away that yellow sweater. Like we say stupid, me and my brother quote Simpsons all the time, but it's such a great show. Table five every yeah. time. Like, <laughs> Oh man. But uh, let's get into your, your one, my friend. I don't want to get naked in front of other guys. Well, who does? You know how many men have seen me naked in my lifetime? A lot. Do you think I'm comfortable with it? No, but I live with it. Freaks and Geeks, which was actually only out for one season from 1999 to 2000. Um, this was created by Paul Feig, uh, who's actually Tim from Heavyweights, which I think is funny. Yeah, uh, He also did Zoe's Extra Extraordinary Playlist. Uh, this show starred an all-star cast of Linda Cardinelli, John Francis Daly, James Franco, Jason Segel, Sam Levine, and Seth Rogen. Uh, it had four wins, including a primetime Emmy for Outstanding Cast for a comedy series. On 15 nominations. So, well, this is one of your picks. Tell me why you love Freaks and Geeks. So there are two things that make me wish that I was a teenager in like the late 70s, early 80s. One of them is Richard Lanklater's Dazed and Confused. Um, and I don't know if wish is the right word, but like just curious is what it would have been like to be a teenager then. The other is Freaks and Geeks. Now, we like we said right off the bat, Freaks and Geeks only lasted a year. I think it was, what, 22 episodes. It was a long season for a first season. Um, but it was like absolutely iconic. It was, you know, everything that those kids went through. Um, and the cast was insane, right? John Francis Daly, Sam Weir went on to write the Spider-Man trilogy, right? He wrote all those movies. I think he directed that new vacation movie with, uh, Ed Helms. That was terrible, mm -hmm. but like he wrote those Spider-Man movies. Um, James Franco, and then, like, the supporting cast, right? Like, Shia LaBeouf was in this as, like, a 12 or a 13-year-old. Um, and Chauncey Leopardi, who was also in The Sandlot as Squints, uh, was in this. He was a little bit older. David Krumholtz, who was also in Oppenheimer, mm -hmm. um, was uh, Neil Schweiber's dad. It's funny. It's heartwarming. It's just, like... It's an iconic show that never got the love it deserved. It deserved a second season just to finish up this story. Now, there's all kinds of rumors swirling around that they want to write a movie because uh, Judd Apatow loved working with these guys so much that he put them in all his all his movies later on. Um, but I would love to see what a movie looked like with these guys like 20, 30 years later as adults. Yeah. And, you know, you hit nail on the head with the way the show just was ended too soon. And you know, having Shia LaBeouf in there, he actually auditioned that for uh, Neil Schreiber's role, but he didn't get it. But he, they liked him so much, they put him in, you know, a side, a side minor role. But just look at the all-star cast of comedy here. Seth Rogen, you know, um, Jason Segel, Linda Carnelli, who went on to do the, you know, other shows. And she yeah. did the uh, Scooby-Doo movies. 
Well, I, I've always been a big Linda Cardinelli fan. Uh, she was in one of my favorite movies, uh, Grandma's Boy. Scooby Doo. <laughs> Grandma's Boy. <laughs> but uh, you know, it was before its time. And when I was reading about this, because it was only last, I think, fourteen episodes. Judd Apatow was really, really pushing to get this picked up for another season. So the way they shot the last episode was they can leave it as a series, a season finale or a series finale. Uh, they had a lot of issues with the studio on this because the studio said they want it to be more happy ending episodes. And Judd Apatow was, like, was saying, no, this is like how I want the series to go. And it's more appealing to our audience. Well, they didn't see it that way. And Apatow went like to great lengths to try to get extended. He even had Ben Stiller come in and film a special guest episode for episode 17, but that never aired because they were canceled. It didn't uh, air, but he was the like the head of the Secret Service when yeah. uh, Jimmy, no, George Bush, the mm -hmm. vice president at the time, visited the school. Yeah. So it's just something that it's, it's just tragedy because it, it could have gone, you know, it could have been big. Maybe just wrong place, wrong time in terms of yeah, when it was released. It, it never, it never quite found its audience. Like I'm looking at the cast here, and like so, Sean Weiss and Ron Lester. You know Sean Weiss and Ron Lester better as uh, Goldberg from the Mighty Ducks, who was in it for a, a bunch of episodes. Ron mm -hmm. Lester was Billy Bob from Varsity Blues. Mm -hmm. Rest in peace. He's gone now. Um, you also have. Um, uh, Tom Wilson, who was Biff from Back to the Future, was the gym coach, or the gym teacher, like Rashida Jones, Leslie Mann. Like it just the cast was fantastic. It was so well acted and just written from a perspective that like you couldn't believe. Freaks and Geeks was is to me one of the most underrated, one of my favorite TV shows of all time. Yeah, it's totally underrated. If you haven't seen it, uh, I don't know. Where can they watch it? So do you know? That they so, yeah, I actually have it right here. Mm -hmm. um, you can watch it on Hulu, Amazon Prime, and Paramount Plus. Um, okay. All have them available for streaming. Cool. Yeah, check check it out. Like, it's worth it. I know my, uh, my I told Jen one of your, this pick, and she was like, oh, I love that show. <laughs> he all, like So he loved this cast so much. He wrote another show two or three years later called undeclared about being a freshman in college. Mm -hmm. Um, and it had, uh, the dude from, um, he was in not grandma's, he was in, uh, she's out of my league. And I know who you're uh, talking about. he hates, uh, he, he hates Jonah Hill. Hey, brush, but Jay Barshall. Jay Barshall. Yeah. Jay yeah. He's, uh, he's the, the lead character in undeclared. And that's a really good show too. Not quite freaks and geeks level, but really, really good. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, the talent in this just shows like what well, they did. Jason Siegel, how, how I Met Your Mother. Yeah. Like Seth Rogen did his own thing. James Franco did his own thing until he decided to be a perv. To be a scumbag, uh, yeah. Yeah, but you know, they all made it big. Like I said, Linda Carnelli did her other movies. Pretty much, most of that cast did something going forward in Hollywood. Um, just, just a really good, underrated, heartwarming show. I love totally, it. Totally, totally. Yeah. Uh, but let's move on to our next one. Wendy Correctional Facility, Alden, New York, a half hour from the Canadian border, 10 hours from here. They call it the ice box, Idalo. So you have your family send the earmuffs for those days where it gets 10 below in the yard. And you are there for the rest of your life. Oh, so you're trying to run a game on me now. Game's been run, dickhead. You ship out tomorrow. <laughs> Wrong cop. NYPD Blue, which ran from 1993 to 2005, 12 seasons. It was created by Stephen Bacco, who also created Hill Street Blues, L.A. Law, and Murder One. And, and David, Cop Rock. Yes, Cop Rock. <laughs> and David Milk, 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 who also was a writer on Hill Street Blues, he wrote Deadwood and Brooklyn South. Uh, this show starred Dennis Franz, Jimmy Smith, David Caruso, Gordon Clapp, James McDaniel, Nicholas Tutorio, and Kim Delaney. It had 88 wins, including 20 primetime Emmys, or by Dennis Franz alone and 203 nominations total. <laughs> now, this show was when I was growing up, this is one of my picks. This show was the biggest like cop show, you know, from Hill Street Blues was big, but this is one of like ones that was every gotta watch television. Uh Dennis Franz's portrayal of Annie Sipowitz is iconic in terms of film. He's a Chicago-based guy, so my family was really, really into it. 
David Caruso was in the first season. He won a Golden Glove, got a big head, and got into fights with them to where they moved all the material over to Andy and Jimmy Smith's, and it just carried from there. The show ran for 12 seasons. It, like, Franz basically retired off this. He doesn't do anything else. Uh, you know, it was a, one of the first cop shows to show semi-nudity. Very graphic in terms of the crimes that were done. You know, I'm a big fan of Law & Order, but I think this show just outdoes Law & Order in terms of content, greenness. Had good storylines. Even, you know, towards the end when they brought in, um, what's his name? Uh, Buddy from Saved by the Bell. Rick Schroeder? No, Rick Schroeder. Rick Schroeder oh, Mark horrible. Paul Gossler. Mark, Mark Paul Gossler. Gossler. Yeah. Rick Schroeder was in the show too, and his character was bad, which is why he was written off. Yeah. But uh, Mark Paul Gossler, when they brought him in, it actually wasn't as bad of a transition to him being with partner with Sipowitz. I thought the show was done great. You know, it of course every show eventually you lose goes on fumes and gets played out. Uh, this is one a very I watched the season of uh, you know all the seasons back to back to back on Hulu just to go through it again, and it's an enjoyable, it's gritty, and you can see why it was so popular back then, and it was a real big trend center for crime shows going forward, in my opinion. What do you think, Swell? So I didn't watch the first season of NYPD Blue. I've never seen the first season. But when Jimmy Smith came on the show, I was like, yep, I'm in. Like, I watch this. Uh, I'm going to throw it back to The Simpsons real quick. One of my favorite lines in The Simpsons is Homer's getting ready for church. And Marge goes, homie, you can't wear a short sleeve shirt with a tie. And Homer goes, oh, but Detective Sipowitz does. <laughs> yes. And talk about like a character arc. Sipowitz, like when we first meet Sipowitz in season one, he's a drunk, womanizer, racist. Uh, like totally like horrible person, but a good detective and his character arc, the way he, you know, he's anti LGBTQ that changes. Like as the season progresses, it shows him developing as, and it's not like, Oh, one thing changes. It's just like him. And you could see like the character changing for the better as he goes forward in life. And yeah, he goes it was, through a lot of tragedy too. It was really, really well written. The only like, also, so a couple, couple observations. One, mm -hmm. like when this show was on, Sharon Lawrence was a fucking smoke show. Yeah, like she was hot as shit. If we're being honest, right? Mm -hmm. Two, um, Detective Sipowitz shows his fat ass in the shower <laughs> in the end of one episode, right? Like, yeah, that's like the they did not care, man. They wrote what they wanted to. They made what they wanted to, and I agree with you, man. I love this show. I was a little surprised that it made it into your top shows of all time, but like mine, my shocker one would have been like ER. Oh god, yeah. But but like this is a, this was a good pick. This is like a low key sleeper pick. Yeah, the only thing that I kind of found like was what's hilarious now, but like it could have been done better casting is they had Nicholas Satorio, who's actually Italian, play a right. Puerto Rican. Right. And I noticed that in the show, he never spoke Spanish <laughs> throughout the whole show. Um, his dad was actually Luis Guzman <laughs> in the show, which made me laugh too. But it, I, I understand it's time of the 90s. But, yeah. uh, that, but he, he actually played a good role as uh, James Martinez in that show. Like, all the characters were very well fleshed out. Like I thought they did a good job. And the way, you know, one of the best episodes is, is when Jimmy Smith's character actually passes away. You know, that whole saga of him passing away was very sad um, to where people still say they cried over it, like when it happened. But yeah, I, it, it's an iconic show to me. I, I agree with you. Like it broke some ground. Yeah, for real. But uh, which of you picked Small Wonder? Well, you have to find out, Brian. <laughs> She's a small... Sorry, I won't sing anymore. That's good. Uh, let's go into your next pick, my man. I'll give you 24 hours to deliver that witch to me. And if you don't, I will personally eat, fuck, and kill all three of you. True Blood, which ran from 2008 to 2014 on HBO for seven seasons. It was created by Alan Ball, who produced Six Feet Under, Uncle Frank, and American Beauty, uh, starring Anna Paquin, Stephen Moyer, Sam Trammell, Ryan Quainton and Chris Bauer. This show had 38 wins, including one primetime any and 158 nominations total. Swole, this is one of your picks. Tell me why you chose True Blood. So I love True Blood. I love vampire stuff. Like it's like right off the bat, the first episode, like uh, everyone knows that vampires exist, right? But like they don't talk about them and they sell this synthetic blood called True Blood. So the first scenes in this liquor store in like bumfuck Louisiana and like it's just it draws you in really, really good. It was an HBO show. So like they didn't care about what 
boundaries they crossed or like what they showed. Um, Anna Paquin was really, really great in it. And like by the end of season two, you were like, are you, are you team bill or are you team? Uh, uh, what was Alexander Skarsgård's name? I'm having a brain fart. Um, it was uh, team uh, bill or Eric, right? You're a team bill or your team, Eric. Um, it, it's just a really good vampire flick. I love vampire stuff. I love horror stuff. I love anything HBO usually does, except for that god awful show that they just did with The Weeknd and Lily Depp Rose, The Idol. Never watched um, it. Oh my god, it was such a piece of shit. Um, Eric, his name was Eric North. Yeah, it was. You were either Team Bill or Team Eric. Like you didn't know which way Sookie was gonna go. It probably lasted a season longer than it needed to be. Um but it was really good. One of the highlights of my vacation was um, one morning we did the Warner brothers tour, right? And they used these sets for a whole bunch of different things. And we turned the lot onto the tour, the five minutes into it. And it was um, the bar like Merlot, like from true blood. And I was like, Holy shit. Like, this is fantastic. This is really, really cool. Um, this was at the peak HBO could do no wrong, right? Like I think the wire was still airing or it just ended. The Sopranos was in its peak entourage was in its peak. Um, this is, this is a great vampire show. Yeah. This came out actually after the Sopranos actually was done. I think the wire was still going on. I can't remember. Um, but I, you know, I totally get the, the why you like the show a lot. To me, I watched it like I really couldn't get into it as much. I mean, it's enjoyable from what I watched. Um, but I, I always, whenever I think of the show, I always think of the teaser they had or the trailer they had for the show. And they would have Anna Paquin and she'd be like, I know a vampire. And like it always like stuck, stuck in my head. Um, Jen actually started re- watching the show because she's never seen it. And the more I, I love the way it's shot in terms of uh, the creepiness atmosphere. Yeah. It's to me, it's what Twilight. Like Twilight's basically a watered down, horrible version of, the, of what it, of this is. Oh my god! I yeah, yeah. So I think maybe that was that concept or idea from Twilight was pulled from something like this because there's a lot of similarities in it. Uh, but I, it's not, it's not a bad show. Like it does. I mean, but how much, how much more can you write about? Like when it comes to horror um, series, it's kind of hard to keep the story going in terms of how you want to continue it and. Right, you know, Brian's bringing up a great point too. And in, in the era, this show came out, you know, in the era of Six Feet Under, which is another great show about a family that uh, owns a funeral home. You know, Oz, Oz is one of the first shows that came out about prison that was shot in HBO. That was, you know, and then we, you know, of course, Sopranos. Uh, this is when HBO could do no wrong, and they tried right. something new, and I actually liked it. I still like HBO programming the way they shoot everything, and you know, to not to more go off on a little a rant, but. They're talking about reviving Constantine, the movie. Before that happened, they were talking about bringing that to HBO as a adult version of Constantine, which is something I would love to see them do because they have a good track record of taking care of, you know, properties. They did so with the Watchmen and, you know, they could do, I think they could do it with Constantine. Like if they shot somewhere in, the, in the, like the same way they shot the Watchmen and True with it, I'd be all for it. Yeah. Like I, I would be into that too. I think like HBO, yeah, it was like it was cheesy as shit, but it like there were parts of it that were like you were just you were like, holy shit, I have to watch this. It was like tune in TV. Like I had to watch it because I didn't want anybody spoiling it for me on Monday afternoon. Right. Like, mm-hmm. um, but no, HBO had like HBO had this track record of like producing great things like like the Sopranos, like the wire, like Oz. Um, and then they do these one offs and they were terrible. Right. Like, do you remember John from Cincinnati? Yeah, like okay. it was only on for a year and it was terrible. The Idol was terrible. Then they did a show. It lasted two or three seasons with Thomas Jane called Hung, about him becoming oh, a yeah. porn star. Like, then they pass on shows too, right? Like they passed on Sons of Anarchy. They passed on Breaking Bad. Um, they also had like shows like uh, there was supposed to be a show with. James Gandolfini called the night of about him being an attorney. And unfortunately he passed after the first episode. So they uh, brought somebody else in. Um, John Tutorial, I think was brought in, but stuff like that. I mean, they, they do have like misses, but I think their track record is better. To, you know, is I think they, I think they have more hits well. than they do misses. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, so Hung was actually kind of fun. You know another show that's a good talk a lot? And it's not on our list, but another HBO show that is Arliss. Arliss. Yeah. That show was hilarious. Like, you know, Arliss Michaels, it's about an agent in sports. A and sports agent, yeah. Like the shit he goes through is hilarious in there. Like, and especially when it had all the celebrities and the, you know, the athletes, David Wells is in there, you know, Reggie um Jackson was in there. There's just little oh, cameos. Like- Eastbound mm-hmm. and Down too, right? Like yes, Eastbound, Eastbound and Down, Down was hilarious. Yes, uh, with Danny McBride. I think you know. it, it was a certain time when it was True Blood, and then Eastbound and Down followed it on Sunday nights. Mm-hmm. Larry Sanders show, another show that was freaking hilarious. You know, they they do they they do good things. You know, I wish they would kind of go back to that more. But well, and you know what? Like I hate to say it, but like some of the streaming service stuff has killed like the magic of HBO, right? Like. I remember very vividly, and you and I have had this conversation, like going to my cousin Roger's house on Sunday night to watch The Sopranos, and it was event TV, right? And like the streaming aspect of it has killed it. Like we haven't even talked about Game of Thrones, right? Like yeah. I know like it's not your thing, but it was good for a long time, and then it wasn't, right? Like any show, though. But see, that's the thing, though. Like you like what you like. I'm not going to like I might mess with you with it, but... I, I don't really fault you for watching. You know, that just wasn't. Oh. I tried giving a, 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 you know, for instance, The Walking Dead. I watched the first season. I thought it was incredibly done well. Second season, and then I'm like, these people have to eventually die because they're fucking being chased by zombies. By zombies. And I it watched went out for like another twelve years or something. Like I that. watched two episodes and I was like, this isn't for me. But I get it, man. <laughs> like, I watched a show about fucking vampires that like. And Sookie Stackhouse turned into a fairy at the end of season yes, two. Yes. I was like, what the fuck, man? Like they brought it first. It was vampires. Then there were werewolves. Then there were lichens. Then there were, it was everything, man. Like I can't knock people for watching breaking bad for 12 years. Cause I sat through seven seasons of a vampire show. Yeah. Shit. And- I'm rewatching one tree Hill right now oh because God. I'm a fucking idiot. Like you like what you like, but I understand why, why the audience is there. So if you like game of Thrones, I mean, great. There's certain aspects of Game of Thrones that, like, I mean, the books I've heard were are very well well done. Um, but there's certain aspects, like the the Red Wedding, you know, that was awesome. Oh, but you know, I just the, the thing with the dragons is what, is what always threw me off. Like, I gotcha. Uh, I gotcha. But I mean, I, you like what you like, and like True Blood has that following, and there's been namoring, I think, for a revival of the show. I don't know how you would do that, but you know, it could be done if HBO wants to pick it up. They have the writers to do it. But I, I current personally um, wasn't one of my favorite shows, but I understand why people liked it a lot. Yeah. But uh, let's move on to our next one. She got possessed. I cut her head off with a shovel. Then she did this crazy dance in the moonlight. I put her head in a vice and I cut it with a chainsaw. She did have a rock and bod, though. Ash versus the Evil Dead, which ran for three seasons from 2015 to 2018, created by Ivan Rami who was also a writer on Darkman, Army of Darkness, and Spider-Man 3. He's the brother of Sam Raimi, who is known for his Spider-Man franchise, Evil Dead franchise, Darkman, Xena, Warrior, Princess, Hercules, when he's not uh, being too right-winged, and Tom Spilizzi, who also did Leftovers and created the series The Watchmen, is what we mentioned earlier. This show starred Bruce Campbell, Ray Santiago, Dana De Lorenzo, and Lucy Lawless. It had a, won eight, uh, 12 awards on 18 nominations. So this is one of my picks. And this, you know how big of a fan I am of Evil Dead. Yeah. When I heard this show was out, I heard about it a season too late. Reason being was because this was on fucking stars. stars. And I, you know, once I got into it, I watched every episode up to episode uh, season three. And if you haven't seen it, season three ends on a cliffhanger because they were on the verge of cancellation due to low ratings because it was on fucking stars. The thing is basically shot of Ash, basically Ash Williams after everything happens in the Evil Dead franchise to him living in his current life now. And he meets Ray Santiago at work and De, uh, Dana De Lorenzo when the, the Deadites are coming back due to Ash doing something when he was high. It's hilariously done. It's all straight Rami, the, you know, it's written by him and his brother. So it's all straight, you know, from a source. Greatly done comedy horror, which I love. Bruce Campbell is a fucking legend. I love Bruce Campbell as Ash Williams. Unfortunately, it did not get picked up for a fourth season, so left on a cliffhanger. Fans have been crying to get this show rebooted 
and have that last season. Unfortunately, when this show ended, Ash, um, as Ash, Bruce Campbell retired. And you can see why, because he gets bloody and him or one of the castmates get bloody in every episode in this. But the comedy in it is, to me, was hilarious. I really enjoyed it. I thought the story was done well. Lucy Lawless was awesome in it as an extra cast member. And, you know, they still do tours just for a small thing. I just wish it was given the, uh, given the actual, you know, uh, audience for it. And sorry about my dog barking. But the actual no, audience, okay, the actual audience for it that could have, you know, survived. Because I think if it was released now, it would be pretty big. That's my opinion. Have you ever seen this one? So, yup, this is a show that, like, I love Evil Dead movies. I And mm-hmm. you already touched on it. I did not watch this because it was on Stars, and I don't need another fucking streaming service. Mm-hmm. Um, it was the same reason that I didn't watch Power or Ghost, right? They're all critically acclaimed. They're all really good from what people say, but I had no desire to pay for Stars. Like, if this were to come on eventually down the road, like a Netflix or a Hulu, like, I would watch the shit out of this. Yeah, I think it it might be on Netflix now. Oh, uh, yeah, I think Spax says it's on Netflix yeah. now. Okay. So um, to check it out, I enjoy it. Like there's a lot, it's like, full our cop, like the way our humor, like it's going to fall right in because Bruce Campbell, the way he makes fun of himself is just great. You know, and it, it doesn't take itself too seriously, which I think a lot of horror you know, shows try to. Like there's a scene where um, he fight, he goes to check on a body in a morgue and it basically pushes his his Ash Williams head up the up the ass of the corpse, and he comes out the other end and he's like, "Oh, I smell like shit." And there's um a part where he meets up with Dana De Lorenzo and she's like, "What shit have you gotten into?" He's like, "Don't ever mention ass or shit to me ever again." They just like <laughs> stuff like that. Like it's just like Jen couldn't stop laughing. At it. It's like the com- comedy is great. I thought it was nicely written. Unfortunately, like I didn't get carried on. Um, but if I- you haven't seen it, I would re- highly recommend you to watch this one. I will check this out. I, I'm glad to see that it's on Netflix now. I hate when they do that to fans. Even if it's not a show that I watch, mm-hmm. like give the people that invested time in this and like pay their money to watch this, like the ending that these shows deserve. Yeah. And Ray Santiago and Dana Del Rental have said they've been trying to get Bruce Campbell to come back. He just hasn't. He says one day he will, he will, and some days he doesn't. But I think as older as he gets, he's probably not going to come back. Yeah. But yeah, I, it was a show that I really liked a lot. But Unfortunately, nobody saw it. <laughs> but uh, let's move on to your next pick. Fellas, we're broken. We need to change. And, and look, I know change can be scary. One minute, you're playing freeze tag out there at recess with all your buddies. Next thing you know, you're getting zits, your voice gets low. And every time your art teacher, Miss Scanlon, leans over your desk, check and see how your project's going, you feel all squiggly inside. <laughs> hmm. You were the striking woman. Not classically beautiful, but striking. First time I ever saw a tan line. Ted Lasso, which was started in 2020, it's been going out for three seasons, and it is the only show on our list that is current and currently running, uh, besides The Simpsons. It was created by Brandon Hutt, who was actually, the only thing I find about him was he was in Fallout 4 <laughs> as a voiceover. Uh, Joe Kelly, who's a writer for SNL and How I Met Your Mother. And Bill Lawrence, who was a showrunner on big shows like Rubs, Cougar Town, and Shrinking. Uh, the show stars Jason Sudeikis, Brett Goldstein, and Brennan Hutt, who's actually in the show as a writer and actually a star of the um, cast. It's won a 78 awards, including 11 Emmys, four by Jason Sudeikis alone, which is ridiculously, you know, that's like uh, Dennis Franz level, on 190 nominations total. Now, so this is a show I have not watched at all. Um, and the reason being is because of the streaming service on Apple TV, I think, which kind of hinders it for me. So tell me why you love this show so much to get me interested. So this is going to be like absolutely like a complete moment of honesty and transparency here. Uh, I'm wearing Ted right now. <laughs> um, but this show started um, in, I want to say, March of 2020, um, right as the world changed completely. Everything shut down. Um, yeah, but you're not going to like our number one show fits. Um, but, uh, right as the world shut down and nobody knew what was going to happen, we were stuck at home. I was working in a bedroom and a half apartment in Edgewater from home. And I was in a half bedroom with no air conditioning in that summer. And, uh, 
I grew like extremely depressed, right? Like I didn't have, like I hadn't even met you yet. Right. Um, and I didn't have that outlet to talk to people at work every day. Um, and, uh, my, my friend, Jeff bear, who's now my boss, fucking Kelly. Um, Jeff bear is now my boss. Like he was, uh, like one of my OG like friends on Twitter, um, was like, dude, watch Ted Lasso. And I watched Ted Lasso while I was working from home. I was supposed to be chatting with people on apple.com. Right. Um, and I was, I was, but I had my iPad up and I watched Ted Lasso and there were four episodes out already. And I was like, holy shit. Like it's such a positive and uplifting and inclusive show uh, that like it, it, I wouldn't have gotten through COVID without it. Like that is not a lie. That is a complete accurate description. I've written articles about for Penguin, the Penguin website about Bill Lawrence and his ability to relate um, uh, to characters. And if I was, if we would have had another show to watch, if we would have did a top 11, like his other show scrubs, would have absolutely been on this list because he has such an uncanny ability to relate to people um, and write these characters that you emotionally attach to. And Ted Lasso is that for me. Jason Sudeikis is fantastic. Uh, I think her name is Hannah Waddingham uh, as Rebecca is, is brilliant. Uh, but the star of the show for me is Brett Goldstein or Roy Kent. He is this gruff, player that is on his last legs of his playing career and he uh you know he becomes the leader of the team and it's just a good story it's heartwarming it's fun and i'm not the only one man the emmys like everyone loves it the streaming services love it uh, man it's so good yeah so when i was looking for clips for this um I was trying to look for like the funny year clips for, you know, to try to put into our show. And a lot of them were very like high motivational speeches. It, I mean, it by, is, uh, man. Like, and it's kind of crazy that like looking, and I remember when we had Richard Roper on, you know, he was going to do a Ted Lasso panel and he told us like, oh, it's a great show. You should check it out. I just never got around to it. And I think part of it, like to me was because it was on Apple TV. Nothing against Apple. It's just, same thing with streams. It's like, it's like, uh, I don't know if I should. I, I get it, man. Like, I, I don't know if I would have Apple TV Plus if I didn't just get it. Yeah. Right. So like, I think that's where kind of flosses for me. Like, I'm kind of interested in getting it. I don't seeing it, but I don't know. Like, you've been pushing it to me. You know, seeing that Sadekis has won four Emmy, uh, four Emmys alone for his his portrayal of it makes you want kind of like intrigued to watch it because my experience with Jason Sadekis was he was on SNL uh, as a writer. And then he was in this movie called The Rocker with um, Rain uh, Wilson. Rain Wilson, yes. He, <laughs> and there's actually a funny scene in there where he calls uh, uh, what's his name, buddy from the uh, Larry David show, his best friend Jeff. Um, Jeff Garland. Jeff Garland. He calls him Norm from Cheers yeah. to make well, fun of him. And Norm from Cheers is actually his uncle. It's his godfather. Like, his godfather. Like, yes. It's his godfather. George Went is Jason Sudeikis' godfather. There yes. are Cheers references throughout. Ted Lasso. There are Chicago references throughout Ted Lasso because Jason mm -hmm. has spent time at Second City, right? That's where mm -hmm. he got signed from SNL. Um, it's it's just it's brilliant, Yump. I know the Apple TV streaming service scares you, but if Fitz is like agreeing me with some with me on something, like it, I get it, but it's 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 so good. Also, Bill Lawrence on Apple TV Plus wrote this other show that's airing right now with Harrison Ford and Jason Siegel and his wife, who was also, she was in the Drew Carey show. She was in scrub. She was in Cougar town. Uh, shrinking. She, yeah. Shrinking. Shrinking is absolutely brilliant. And it is the same vein as this. It's a dad who's a widow and he's raising his teenage daughter. Like, Apple has invested some money in some good TV shows. And this is the top of that like list. It's real. It's brilliant. Yeah. I'm going to have to pull the trigger and check them out. Like, cause I've been looking for something new to watch besides my usual go to's. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I'm going to have to like you and like a lot of people convinced me, like even today, uh, Baloney was telling me that you got to check out Ted Lasso. Like you'll like it. And I'm like, 
I, I'm like, well, I know why you like it, Blondie, because it's soccer related. And he's like, no, it's like so much more into it. It has like, nothing to do with soccer. Like it does, but it has nothing to do. But uh, from, you know, things I was reading on the side of just his portrayals, like of uh, Jason Sudeikis' portrayal as his, an actor in it, they said that you'll fall in love with the way he does everything. Well, like you've been to my house. Like when you walk into the basement, I have the believe sign, like the play yeah. like a champion today sign. When you walk yeah. down the stairs. Ted Lasso is just it's brilliant and then you can go by the Funko Pops when you fall in love with it like I do <laughs> all right I don't know if Jenny wants me to buy more Funko Pops but yeah <laughs> but I would I'll check this one out I'll, I'll uh I'll tell you what I will watch Ash versus Evil Dead and we'll do a recap on an episode down the road if you mm-hmm. do Ted Lasso because how many seasons was Ash versus Evil Dead three it was three and so is Ted Lasso because Ted Lasso is done airing now okay cool yeah so yeah, okay, I'll watch. I'll watch it. Well, you we can do that. We'll report later. Well, and I think I think Fitz makes a great point. You could probably watch it on the free trial because it's quick, thirty minute episodes, except for the last season where they were like forty five minutes to an hour. Okay, I'll definitely check it out. You guys just told me, so I will definitely check this out. But uh, let's move on to our next one. Well, you're nothing but a crowing cock. And the last cock that walked into my office learned what all the other cocks learn, that I eat cock for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Lewis, you're going to let me in that deposition tomorrow, whether you like it or not. Why? Because you're going to run to Jessica? No, simply because I'm going to tell everyone here in the office that you said you eat cock for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah, that's right. It's goddamn delicious. Mm, mm, mm. Suits, which was aired from 2011 to 2019 for nine seasons, created by Aaron Korsh, who also did the Deep End, Pearson, and Siyuku, which is actually Suits, a Japanese version of Suits, starring Gabriel Mock, Patrick J. Adams, Meghan Markle, Saren Rafferty, Rick Hoffman, and Gina Torres. The show had one win in nine no- nominations. So this is a, something that I got into a little late. I got into it because of TikTok. Seeing a lot of clips from it uh, piqued my interest. Watched the first episode, which is a long one, and I got hooked and basically ran through. I watched the series four times. It's not for everybody, but I think Rick Hoffman's character of Lewis Litt is the best part of the show. His character arc, his comedic timing, he is just a great actor. And it's a travesty he was not nominated for any Emmys because him alone is great. I love the fact they reference movies in here. It's not just a straight up lawyer show. There's a lot of comedy involved. They they do movie quotes. They do uh you know, some uh, there's a part where he's actually negotiating the contract of Darren Williams when he played for the Brooklyn Nets. You know, there's references to Michael Jordan in it. I lo- find it hilarious that's supposed to be shot in New York, but it's actually shot in Toronto. But, you know, it's a lot of comedy in the show that even Jen enjoyed watching. Um, when it gets to the last two seasons, I think it kind of falls off a little bit because they brought in Catherine Heigl, which I don't like her character at all. <laughs> A lot, and I'm reading the Reddit to what that people didn't like it, but I think the overall aspect of it to me was very enjoyable. And they reference the Sopranos and The Wire in the show. And actually, the guy from The Wires in here, the uh, detective, um, as well, the heavy set detective, he's in a Jack Reacher now. He plays the father of Meghan Markle and a lawyer. Uh, like, I, like I really Isaiah Washington? One. No, not Isaiah Washington. Not Isaiah, okay. Um, okay. I can't think of his name. I, know, I uh, think I know who you're talking about now. Yeah, but he plays uh, again Markle's father, and to me, it's uh, Robert. His name's Robert Zane in the show. He's played by um, Wendell Pierce. Wendell Pierce. He was also in Treme. Yeah, Treme. He was in Treme as well. Yeah. Okay. And they they actually make a they make jo- they joke about his character from The Wire in the show within this show, which cracks me up. Um, but yeah, it's to me it was enjoyable, corny, but you know, to me, I I liked everything. But I know you started, it, so tell me how you felt about it. I'm only in season one right now. I'm only like four or five episodes in. I started it and it's a good watch. Like I'm going to, it's not something that, so like I deal with so many people every day at work. I take my iPad with, and Mm -hmm. like I put my headphones in so I don't have to talk to anybody on my hour lunch. It's not something that I could watch on my lunch Mm -hmm. um, because there's some sexy time scenes and stuff like that. Um, But it's really good, and I'm excited to watch more at home when I get a chance. I might actually download a couple episodes from Peacock for the flight. But I got to watch Ash vs. Evil Dead now, too. Yeah, to me, I think Gabriel Mock did a great job in it uh, in terms of the way he plays like a snooty, smart-ass lawyer. 
and eventually his character arc's good. Like Luke List's character arc is great with Kaufman. Uh, Je- Je- Gina Torres' character of uh, 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 Jessica Pearson, which actually went to a spinoff of Pearson that really didn't like, last long. And this is like Meghan Markle's big break. Like nobody really knows Meghan Markle except from Suits. Um, right. It's really, really comedic timing, I think, is done greatly. Uh, and like just, just like certain things that, like, wait, wait until you get to Lewis Litt talk about mud. Like he goes mudding. Okay. And like it's just some hilarious shit that happens from there. You know, Sheila Sass, who's, uh, from she's the girl from The Hangover, Stu's ex girlfriend that goes Stu's ex girlfriend, yeah. She's in this show. She's hilarious. I heard, I heard it was a bartender. Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Stu, fuck that waiter on your boat trip. I heard it was a bartender. Oh. Oh, it was a bartender. My bad. You're right. Yeah. My, yeah. You're right. You and, then, and, then he, like and, then, and he goes, I'm, I'm thinking about getting my bartender's license. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like, get the fuck away from me. Like, but it's to me, it's you know. I really enjoyed it. It's so high on my list because it's something that like I really got into. Meghan Markle's character is probably the most annoying one. But but she's kind of smoking hot, dude. Oh, she is definitely. Yeah. But like the whole premises of Patrick J. Adams being not passing the bar and being a lawyer, which couldn't happen, you know, in right. real life. But just that whole premises makes the show interesting and the people they meet. And you see a lot of recurring people from different shows in here. Uh uh you see the the cop from The Sopranos, the uh, FBI agent. He plays a lawyer. You know, like I said, Wendell Pierce is in this show. Um, other people down the line, you'll see there. You'll recognize, like, oh, I know who that is. That play like small roles. Eric Roberts plays a big role in this. Yeah, um, to me, it just has like a nice little cast, and it, it was enjoyable for me. So if you haven't seen that, definitely recommend check it out. It aired on USA originally, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, which also is like if I was doing a like a what Brian would call would be like a dump list for Drafty Pod, if I was going to put another show on this list, um, uh, well hold hold off, we can we get to our dump list after. uh, Okay, all right, yeah, last one. I gotcha, I Uh, gotcha. But another thing too about this show, it's become very popular. That it's, I think recently it was just moved over to Peacock, and it's become the most watched show on Peacock due to like people running through it. Uh, Gary Mock, who plays Harvey Specter, actually came out and did a Instagram video where he said he met somebody at a function they had, like a gathering. He did an appearance, and the person said he watched Suits seventeen times. Wow! And he was like, "Jesus Christ!" <laughs> and he you goes, said it was a you said it's a quick burn, right? Yeah, it goes through pretty quickly for me. It did, um, but he said he, a guy watched Suits, and the episodes are like an hour though, like forty five minutes to an hour, depending on. If, but he watched it 17 times. Like, I'm not that of a fanatic in it, but it is enjoyable. I highly recommend you watch through it. Just at least get to, like, the Lewis Lit parts because he's the best part of the show. Okay. But uh, let's move on to your next one, Mr. Soboda. I'm so happy, Ari. You made me very happy. I hope you're happy, too. Do I look happy? What's wrong? Has so much cum been squirted in those eyes, you can't see what's right in front of your face. Amanda Daniels takes that job. Vince is fucked, and I'm fucked which means we're all fucked. And we're fucked in the way you like to get fucked, not fucked in the way that normal people like to get fucked. Entourage, released in 2004 to 2011 for eight seasons, created by Doug Elin, who also did the series Ramble On and Bad Santa. The show was also produced by Mark Wahlberg. It stars Kevin Conley, Adrian Greer, Kevin Dillon, Joey Ferreira, and Jeremy Piven. Uh, the show won 14 awards, including six primetime Emmys, three by Jeremy Piven alone on 106 nominations. So, Swole, tell me about one of your favorite shows, Entourage. So, Entourage is the peak of my favorite TV shows. Um, I, uh, You said that the dude, you met a dude that watched Suits like 17 times. I could probably say I've gone through Entourage 20 times, like, I've rewatched this show that many times. It's an annual rewatch for me. Um, I went to the theater like seven times to see the movie and it was terrible. Um, but I love these characters, man. Like they're, they're so bro but like, I love these characters. I love Ari Gold. Uh, I was only about two years in, maybe three years in um, at Apple. And my buddy Travis comes on, up to me. He's like, Hey, like you love Entourage, right? Like I heard you say that, like Entourage is your favorite show. I was like, yeah. He's like, follow me. 
And I go upstairs to the sales floor. He's like, hey, Mr. Piven, this is Justin. Like, he just wanted to say hello. And I absolutely fucking broke down and lost my shit. Like, Ari Gold is like one of the best characters on a TV show ever, right? It's about four buddies that grew up together, man. Like we all have those friends that we've been friends with for years. And this, this is what that was. The cameos in this show were top notch. Some of the storylines were hilarious. Like there's a, there, I think it's in season five or season six. Um, Eric broke up with his girlfriend and, they had made a bet who could sleep with a girl first turtle or E and E was like, he's like a good looking dude. He's Vince's manager and turtles kind of like the chubby fat assistant that wears Knicks jerseys and Yankees hats. And he found a girl on Craigslist that wanted to like hook up with him, but he wanted, she wanted him to wear a furry suit because she was a furry. Right. So the end of the episode turtles, like I can't go through with it, man. It's just too weird. So you see drama in a furry suit having sex with this girl, like, and like they're she's making animal noises and doing the little claw scenes. Like it's funny, it's stupid, it's so stupid. It's about movies, right? It's about like he plays Aquaman before Aquaman yes. was like a thing, right? Medellin, the Medellin. Yeah, Medellin. Like he also like he he his his career is in the shitter, and he lands a Martin Scorsese remake of The Great Gatsby. Right? Was it Gatsby? Yeah, it was Gatsby. I think it was Gatsby. Um, the cameos are fantastic. Uh, it's just it's absolutely one of my favorite TV shows of all time. I'm I, I would love to start a rewatch of it sometime soon. I just gotta get through One Tree Hill, man. <laughs> so so I, I like Entourage. Entourage was like when I was going to college, you know, this is my prime college years, two thousand three, two thousand seven. Entourage was a must watch at the when I was at my fraternity bars or when I was, you know, working. This is always a show we watched on Sundays on HBO due to the characters of Johnny uh, Drama and Turtle. Yep. And Ari Gold was, you know, peak Piven, although Piven has gotten himself into trouble with allegations, you know, recently. Yeah. In the past few years, he was the best at playing a complete asshole. <laughs> and this is comedic gold with Ari Gold. Ari Gold does not give a shit about you except, top, except his money. There's a part where he, like the scenes where him and his wife go to therapy always crack me up because he's like, what am I paying you for? Therapist number four. Like just Ari Gold. Just is, like wife number yeah. two and wife therapist number, number four. <laughs> yeah. He's just, you know, hilarious. Johnny Drama and Turtle are just people. It, it could It's so relatable in terms of like if my friend made it big, like how would I act? And when Mark Wahlberg came up with this, you know, was talking to Doug Elin, talking about the story, a lot of the experiences in here are based off his experiences in Hollywood, uh, which I think is kind of funny. Johnny Drama is actually based off his cousin, which I think is pretty hilarious. Well, uh, and his cousin was not the main star, mm -hmm. but Mark Wahlberg had another TV show called Wahlburgers. It was a mm -hmm. reality TV show about burgers, yeah. about the burger chain, which, by the way, they have really shitty burgers. Yes. They're probably not going to get Wahlburgers as a responsibility, but their burgers are crappy. Right. Mm -hmm. But like the real Johnny drama is in Wahlburgers. He's a yeah. family friend. He shows up all the time and he's kind of like this lovable fuck up. Yes. Which like is what drama was in this TV show. Yeah, and Kevin Conley, like, who... People might not know who Kevin Conley is. Like, I remember him from Unhappily Ever After, which is, like, a horrible show with Bob Bat. I love Bob, Bob, Bob Keckle with... And yeah. also, Nikki Cox was Nikki, a yeah. nap. She was a smoke show, dude. Yeah, but it, it, I mean, to me, it was a funny show, but I remember him as her brother in that show. He actually un was retired, and they wrote this role specifically for him. Uh, it's it, it was before its time. Like, it's... Now, to be honest, it's something I wouldn't, like, watch over and over again. But I see the appeal of it, of why it's funny, um, and why you like it so much. Uh, it's it also like, couldn't be made today. Yeah, definitely. There's lot, no way in no hell. No way in hell could be made today. And one of my favorite parts of the show is when Turtle asks Kevin Dillon, "Hey, have you ever seen 24? When Kevin Dillon actually was a starring at 24 at the time, which always cracks me up. Um, yeah, and also Jamie Lynn Singer's in it. She plays Turtle's girlfriend. She plays herself as Turtle's girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, there's. All the celebrities come in. There's the one where Chuck Liddell comes and scares the shit out of drama. That oh, he's fun. gonna beat the shit out of him in that charity fighting yeah. event. Yeah, he's yeah. Like, oh, guys, I don't. Then it's a joke. He's like, oh yeah, I do. You know, just stuff like it's just randomly out there, crazy storylines, but enjoyable. And I could see why it was so popular. 
uh, you said, like you said, it could be made today. And this is like only 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Like it was yeah. so out there. Um, unfortunately, the movie was really bad. <laughs> the movie was not good. Yeah, I the was movie high hopes for it. And it I, I did really too. Good. Like, and I, it, it has a special place in my heart just because I love the show. <laughs> but it was it was just not a good movie. Like Johnny Drama won an Oscar. Like, yeah. come on, man. Like, um, but no, like the cameos were really, really good. The music like was really, really good. Yeah, the um intros by uh Jane's Addiction, right? The it is Jane's Addiction music. song. Um, but they like there's a whole episode because they did uh Doug Ellen does a podcast mm-hmm. um where they recap the episodes and they talk about the music on the show. Um, uh, really, really good. Um Turtle, like this the show had everything that I love. It was about friends, it was about like partying with your buddies. Turtle was a sneakerhead, and there's an episode where he gets like a custom one of one Fukijama Nike Air Force One, right? Like, and it was when Vince lost all his jobs and they didn't think he was ever going to work again. And he spent 10 grand on a pair of uh, Air Force Ones. Um, there were sports references, there's movie references. There's a part where they it, go by the Phantom when they get Vince to yeah, buy the Phantom. Yeah. And he's like, I'll give you, I'll give you a thousand dollars off if you sign a picture for my daughter. <laughs> yeah. Just, like, it's like so relatable in terms of like, oh, if I was a celebrity, would I really go through all these things? And apparently Mark Wahlberg went through some of them. So it's good, good in that aspect. Like it's not, uh, like I said, for me, it's just not a, a, a keep rewatching, rewatching, but it does have a place where I'll, I'll, I'll pop in a couple episodes if I see it on. I'll watch it. I remember, it's hilarious. I remember for a, a while, the it, they made enough episodes where it went into syndication and I tried to put it late night on WGN mm-hmm. and it had to be edited to shit. And they're like, yeah, this isn't worth it. We can't do this. That reminds me of uh, for our next top pick that was done on, on Mad TV when they made. <laughs> I wonder what it, it is. Show, it was shown on <laughs> PAX, but we can talk about that when we show. But yeah, Entourage is a you know uh, to me it was a quick watch. Uh, it was enjoyable. The characters yeah. were pretty hilarious. They're thirty um, minute episodes. Yeah, Adrian Gurr, like this is this like he hasn't really done anything since I don't think he was in Drive Me Crazy. With he was in Drive Me Crazy with Melissa Joan Hart. Yeah. And then, and then like, I don't, has he done anything like of substance since? Well, Entourage? he's, he's also in a little movie that I love called the devil wears Prada. Oh yeah. He's her boyfriend. He's her, her chef cook boyfriend. But outside of that, has he done any? No, he's kind of retired and he takes up a lot of like uh humanitarian, like Marauders. Stuff. Last he's, movie, yeah. he's a, he's like a good guy that like, he wants to do stuff for, you know, the environment mm. and, you know, good like civil rights causes. He's he seems like a he's completely different than what his character was. Yeah. And like that's kind of funny, too, because uh, going back to suits, Gabriel Mock, his like I said, his character stuck up, money driven. Like people like he said, people will come up to him and be like, oh, you know, I love Harvey Specter. He's like my he's my idol. And he think in his head. Thanks for watching the show, but he's like, I don't know how you can like such an asshole, <laughs> right? Because he's also, they're completely different, and that, that's like, the Adrian Greer is. You said Harvey, but like they mock Harvey Weinstein in Entourage throughout the series. Yes, like they don't talk about the sexual harassment stuff or the like sexual abuse allegations, but like they mock him as being a massive app asshole. Yeah, throughout the series, which is kind of Wahlberg kind of you know putting out there that he's yeah, off, which is good for you. Fuck that guy. But uh, a release clear, a uh, fucking um, uh, dogma asshole. Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> yeah, we we've talked about that. There's rumors that it's going to be digital any day, any day now, any month. Like, like because he needs the money for lawyers. Yeah, he. I don't know. Fuck him. Yeah, fuck him. <laughs> but uh, let's get into our mutual pick now. This these are our four shows a piece that we uh, enjoyed, and this is our. Number one that we both agreed on instantly. And I'm pretty sure you guys know which one it is. You're not going to believe this. It killed 16 Czechoslovakians. Guy was an interior decorator. This house looked like shit. The Sopranos, which ran from 1999 to 2007 for six seasons, actually seven since it was six. The sixth season was split into six A and six B. The creator was David Chase, who also was a producer on The Rockford Files and I'll Fly Away. The show starred James Gandolfini, R.I.P., Lorraine Baracco, Eddie Edie Falco, Michael Imperioli, Stephen Van Zandt, Dominic Chinese, Tony Sirico, R.I.P., and Steve Sherpa. The show had 122 wins, including 21 Emmys, three by Gandolfini by himself and three by Falco. 
and over 309 nominations. Now, this show, which is kind of funny because Spag said he watched the surprise, watched the surprise again. I've seen this show, no BS, at least 25 times. Uh, same. Like I it, watched it through and through. I I know, like uh, Fitz, I know you don't like The Sopranos, but to me, it's so iconic in terms of it set the groundwork. Like, like I think Oz opened the door and The Sopranos just fucking broke through in terms of writing David Chase's writing, the characters that were done, the obsession with the culture. You know, we've always, America's always had this obsession with the mafia. We showed it in the Godfather films. We showed it in Scarface, a different type of mafia. Where David Chase put into this, even mafiosos are watching this show. So where there's rumor, there's, you know, not even rumors, there's facts that mobsters actually call James Gandolfini. And that's where we get the it, famous, a dog doesn't wear, wear shorts. shorts. <laughs> so, you know, they loved it. And it was realistic in terms of the, the you know, the brutality in it. The writing, James Gandolfini show just became America's darling in terms of the way he acted. Woke up this morning, Alabama 3, another band that, that was their number one only hit, and it was because of The Sopranos. It was sampled yeah. by hip-hop artists because, like, of what this show meant to everyone. Yes, and, you know, so many iconic characters. Ralph Ferretto, Christopher, Jr., you know, uh, Bobby Bacala. You have um, uh, Vito. Silvio <laughs> you know, Dante. Silvio like, Dante, yeah. Like, they're not even part of, like, the main family that are uh, iconic. Artie, you know, Artie, you know, the Vesuvio, like, it's just, to me, it's always been, like, a thing that just broke through, and like I said today to Spags, there, if there's no Sopranos, there's no Wire. Wire is a great show. There's no Sopranos, there's no Breaking Bad, and Brian Cranston actually came out and said, if there wasn't a Tony Soprano, there would be no Walter White, and that's, true. that's a true tribute to how a big of an impact the show was. This was one of the first shows, first television, cable television show ever to win an Emmy for Outstanding Drama Series. Uh, James Gandolfini won a Golden Globe for his portrayal of Tony Soprano. This made him, but it also let him branch out into, you know, different avenues. I love this show. It's my all-time favorite. And Swole, I know you feel the same. Yeah, like, it's it, it's ingrained in my head, like, the dialogue from the show. I was out to dinner with my parents today before, like, we recorded with Kelly. Um, uh, and we went to this pizza place in Cary and they had, it was also a butcher shop and they served rabbit. Mm -hmm. And my dad looks at me and he goes, well, they're going to eat what I cook them. And it was Artie Bucco when like he killed the rabbit that was eating his plants in his garden. Right. <laughs> with a fucking and rifle <laughs> with a rifle. Right. My dad and I speak in Sopranos quotes. Like it, it's, it has, it, it will never go away for me. Like, it took the mafia, the things that I love about mafia movies, the Goodfellas, the Casino, the Godfather, and it humanized it, right? Like, they were a family, right? And Tony had to deal with his fuck-up son and his, like, his daughter that was a pain in the ass and his narcissist sister, right? Like, it's, it's just so well-written and it was so well-done and it was appointment TV. I watched this every Sunday as it aired with my family and it it's just brilliant and it will never not be my favorite TV show to ever exist. Yeah. And it had great like characters in terms of like, you know how every season has like the, uh, the villain or the, you know, the uh, antagonist of the season. Like you had Richie Aprio and then you had Ralph Sifaretto, you know, two iconic characters. And then Phil Leotardo, who, you know, was based, played by, um, please tell me what his name is. Not Vincent Pastore. No, Vincent Pastore is, um, is uh, uh, pussy. Pussy. yeah yeah um oh you God, feature Lamana, brian brian quoted yeah yeah feature mana robert robert Logosha. robert uh, r <laughs> as in robert logia <laughs> yeah um oh you just like those characters are so iconic you know johnny sacrimony you know just uh, frank vincent's his name i could think you go frank, frank vincent yeah yeah johnny Gian, sack you know those characters are just iconic like everybody, you know, you have Ralph Sofaretto who beef still quotes to this day, you know, pie am I, like a fucking whore. She was like, a whore. Yes. Yeah, she, she was, was a, a whore. A, she was a whore. And B, she was a whore. No, no. But, well, and then know, like remember when he's like when he's like he he's he's obsessed with gladiator? Oh yes. <laughs> he's like 
just so good. Joey Pants is so underrated, oh and this was this was his best role. Yeah, Joey Pants, like Joe, Joe Pantelio, like his him adding to the cast is great. You know, Adriana. Another, like yeah. a lot of people like were so upset what happened to her in this in this season, you know, series. Tony Sirico, Tony, so, so not a lot of people know like Tony Sirico was actually like connected, like a legit connected guy. And yeah. when they offered him this role, he said, I'll do this, but you have to put in my contract that my character won't be a rat. Hey. Which is hilarious. Uh, and David Chase actually said that Sirico did his own hair. He wouldn't let the makeup team touch it. He actually would, would do, go three hours early and comb his own hair for the wingtips. You know, wing Michael, tips. Yeah, Michael Imperiali, you know, with Christopher, I didn't, you know. I stuff didn't. like you know, we always use the quote of Quasimodo. Quasimodo, Quasimodo. <laughs> there you go, there it is. You know that that's that's so iconic. Like he was the, he was never a varsity athlete. You know, Junior <laughs> Soprano, like uh, he, he um, it's just so many good things. And like one of the teams that sticks out to me, so I know where I'm rambling on, but one of the teams that sticks no, out no, you're to good. me is um, when they go when it's like the, I think it's season one and they go get um, the the family they're gonna go serve warrants to them. And subpoenas, and they knock on Junior Soprano's door, and they're like Corrado Soprano, and he opens up his curtain, and the first thing goes fuck. <laughs> they close, they close like stuff like that. It has Larry Boy Barisi, who was actually in Goodfellas as the uh, the nightclub owner. Yeah, like they there's so many fuck people, you pay me. Yeah, there's so many <laughs> people from Scorsese's films. You know, Vincent Pastor, who played a small role in uh, Goodfellas, and then he was in Gotti, the HBO rendition of Gotti. He the good one, movie. not the yeah. Kevin Connolly directed one with John Travolta. Yeah, the one with um, Amara Sante yeah. as uh, Gotti. He plays a big role as Big Puss, and like this is before the show got popped off, and they they welcome him back to get you know it made his career. It, it's you know Talking Sopranos was released where they went through every episode. Another good show to check out. Another podcast. It's just so iconic. Like well, I like, I love this show. We haven't like Lorraine Bracco was in Goodfellas. Like she was she was Karen Hill. Yeah, yeah, and Uncle Junior wasn't Godfather. He was a Godfather too. He was Johnny Ola. So was Sony Sirico. He played a small role as well in it, you know. And that's the best part that that cracks me up the most is that Steven Van Zant actually auditioned for Tony Soprano. Uh, Ray Liotta was the first pick, at, you know, to be that. Before he turned it down, and he claims it's one of his biggest regrets. Chaz Palminteri was considered. He couldn't do it because of what he was doing in terms of film and Broadway. Uh, he's another thing. That he said that it's one of the roles that he. Doesn't regret because James Gandolfini was the best person for it. But Steven Van Zandt auditioned for Tony Soprano. David Chase liked him so much that he created a whole role for him in Silvio Dante. And how iconic is Silvio Dante? Like, I mean, like not only like are not only are you in the greatest TV show to ever exist, but you're in the E Street Band with Bruce Springsteen. Like you are a musician and you wanted to act. And you did it almost seamlessly. And then he did that other show about the mafia. Lily Hammer. He, Lily Hammer, right? Like he was really good in that too. Yeah, it's just it's iconic, man. There's, it really is. That's the only way. Like, what other what other TV show like do you remember where you can actually name the names of episodes, right? Like, can you tell me? And you probably can because you you you're like me. Like, can you tell me an episode, a name of an episode of Suits? But you know Pine Barrens, you know yes. long term parking, right? Like you can go back in time and be like, I remember Pine Barrens. Like I want to watch the Pine Barrens episode. Like I want to watch long term parking where Adriana gets whacked, right? Like, yeah, it's so good. There and there's all like there's little stupid fucking nods to other things in pop culture, like when uh when Christopher dies, they get in the car and he puts on the Departed soundtrack and he goes T. Have you heard this yet? It's fucking fantastic, right? And he shows them the Departed soundtrack, which was a nod to Martin Scorsese. Or when Olivia dies and they take the elevator down at the funeral home, it's like a nod to God, the Godfather, right? Like they did all those subtle little things to pay respect to the mafia stuff that came before, but also broke so much new ground. Yeah, and I think that's the great thing about David Chase's writing. And I, you know, I had a discussion with some people about the dream sequences. Uh, the dream <laughs> fits. I know you don't like Silvio Fitz, but the thing that really caught me on to Sopranos was um, so I went to school for co- my first degree in college is in forensic psychology. Like, I love his dream sequences, I love decipher- you know, deciphering what he meant by them. 
some of it's point blank and some of it's like random, you know, uh, when Dr. Melfi has a dream about Tony going through the window and the, with the Louis Ravad song in the background, you know, just uh, stuff. With, you're out of the woods. You're yeah. out of the woods. One of my favorite uh, one is when Tony's in a coma and he goes and like, he basically is, can't, he has a different personality. He have speaks infinity. Differently. Yeah, he speaks totally differently. Uh, he's trying to, he goes and when he's like, they kind of make it seem like he's about to pass on. And, you know, Steve Buscemi, who's actually, he kills him earlier in the series. Yeah. Is actually, the doorman says, oh, you don't need your, your luggage with you. We'll take that. We'll Just take it. Inside. And Tony sees this light flashing in the, like the, like the opposite direction. Yeah. And he's like, no, I think I'm good. Like, I I don't want to go in there. Like, he had this feeling. He's like, I don't want to go in there. Yeah. And then you hear the voice of Meta, a little girl calling out for her dad. But in reality, as they cut for, you know, show what's really going on, it's Meadow telling him not to die. It's just like little things like that. Like, I really love the attention to detail, you know, and like the, like the characters, like Furio, we quote Furio on here a lot. All the time. Yeah. Um, that character, Francisco Tanucci, like he's, he was great. You know, it, it's I, I just it's just iconic to me. I know Fitzy didn't like it. It's not for everyone, but to me, it's the greatest. No, it's for everyone TV, except for TV people. Series. Except for people that are wrong. <laughs> like I didn't say they're bad people. I just said they're wrong. You know, to me, I like. I, it's just, it's the greatest TV show series ever created, and it's not on. It, it, not just me saying that. There's a lot of people saying that because it's on a lot of you know number one in a lot of lists. Like just Tony's Tony's relationship with AJ, right? Like. Like mm-hmm. he just wants him to succeed. He wants him to do good. But like AJ's got some great like stories that are going on there. Like when he he falls in love with Blanca and then, you know, he tries to kill himself and Tony rescues him, right? Like uh, it, it, it's just, it's just, it's perfect. It's perfect television. Totally is. And, uh, you know, it deals with a lot of murder and a lot of bad people. He was the best guy around. What about the people he murdered? What it's murder? <laughs> I had to get that in there for Brian. Well, but, like, so that, that audio clip, right. Is they're talking about John Gotti mm-hmm. and it was like a TikTok thing, but like, there's a scene where, uh, Tony's golfing with his neighbor Coos. He's like, did you know Gotti? And he's like, yeah, I knew Gotti. And they, they, they tell this whole story and it's fucking hilarious. Yeah, about the, 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 the ice cream, ice cream truck. truck. Yeah. That's, fucking- that's another total troll job by, uh, Tony Soprano as, he basically makes a package filled with sand and, yeah. tell, and tells his neighbor like, because his neighbor was making him feel bad because he was basically like only with, friends with him because he was a, a gangster. Yep. He gives him the fucking package. He's like, hey, hold on to that for me. I'll and don't, come get it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll come get it. He just gives it to him just to fuck with him, which tells me like the character depth of him. And Tony Soprano is not a great, like a good person. No, he's but, a terrible person. But it's so interesting. Like the character is, you know. Like even Bobby Bacala, everybody loves Bobby Bacala. Oh, Bobby's so sweet, but Bobby was a fucked up person too. He was, man. He loved his trains. Yeah, but oh my god, I, I, I like I. Every year I go through it, I watch it. Jen always laughs because she's like, "Oh, you're watching Surprise again." But it's just to me, it's an enjoyable watch. It really is. So that is our list of TV shows. I know we rambled on for a little bit for that one, but that's our list. Let us know your list at Yumper and Swole on Twitter. Uh. Thank you guys for watching this one. Uh, we still have a little bit of a show left to go into news and rumors, but Swole, I know we're going to talk about, give me your dump list of some shows we did not mention that could have been on this list. Yeah, on my list alone, I have a couple. One is uh, Mr. Robot with uh, Rami mm-hmm. Malek. Um, I really, really enjoyed uh, Mr. Robot. Um, Friday Night Lights is another show that I absolutely love with the exception of season two. Um which was written during a writer strike and it was awful. Um, and I, I know I talked about scrubs scrubs would have been on absolutely would have been on that list. Um, so th- that's my dump list. Those three are my dump list scrubs, Friday night lights and Mr. Robot. Yeah, for me. Uh, so I have a few first being boardwalk empire. Another written by um, uh writer for Sopranos. Love that show. Second would be a uh, Law and Order. I was a big Law and Order fan, not towards the end, but when they had uh, Jerry Orbach. Jerry Orbach was my guy. As Lenny Briscoe, I watched that show repeatedly. Um, the next thing I, I would say that I watched a lot was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Oz was it really big. I grew up watching that. Very cheesy, but something that I really like adapted to in terms of the way it was shot, the characters. It got very cheesy towards the end. Uh, and then ending it off, a show that's more newer, 
that still is ongoing is Stranger Things. Didn't really get into it after the first season cause, until I heard about it, and I just I fell in love with it. You I know binged, you, guys, you binged the yeah. shit out of it. I watched the first season and I really liked it, and I just couldn't get into the second season. Mm-hmm. I really, really, really want to try again. Yeah, it's it's just something that I really liked. So those are my uh, four shows. Uh, if House, uh, spe- so Specs, I tried House. I love the guy who plays House. Um, I just couldn't get into it. I don't know why. I think like my my best friend Mike and I used to make fun of House all the time. It was the same fucking episode every week. Mm-hmm. This week on House, <laughs> Doctor House cures a deadly disease that we no one else can find the answer for. It was the same fucking thing every week. Twenty four is another show that I watched. Uh, not on our top list, but uh, it was an interesting show. I couldn't like shows like Son of Anarchy. I tried getting into that. I couldn't get into it because maybe it was on FX and it wasn't like I thought from seeing the Sopranos so that it wasn't as gritty. And due to it being on public TV, I couldn't. Get, it's kind of like when the Sopranos did the like I, when we did the Mad TV skit on Pax and they yeah. cut out all the bad parts, even though I, it wasn't as bad like what Son of Anarchy in terms of they cut everything out. It just wasn't to me where it like I got into it as much breaking bad i watched it a few times i think it's a very very well done um i would agree series uh it's not in my top list but i can see why it's in other people's top list i watched the shit out of sons of anarchy like i enjoyed the hell out of it um i i enjoyed breaking bad i never got into better call saul like the spinoff mm-hmm. my dad swears by better call saul like he loves it more than breaking bad um but yeah uh, Atlanta with uh, Donald Glover would have been a show that I also put on that list. Um, I love the I love the new trend of TV shows where it's better to go out on top with good writing and good acting than to like let that shit linger on and write like four terrible seasons. Like Ted Lasso did three seasons and done. Atlanta did three seasons and done. Right? They like they're they're kind of going to the way of like the like the BBC shows, the British broadcasting shows, mm-hmm. where like, hey, we're gonna do three seasons, we have a story to tell, and that's it. We're not gonna drag this out for dough. Yeah, and I think that's I hope they still do that to make because I'm it's a, like unless they cram everything on to right. You know, if they flush it out correctly, I think it'll be great. Another series and the last one to talk about that I watched a shitload as a kid is Are You Afraid of the Dark? Oh yeah. Uh it was like one on of the stick? first yeah, one of the first series to show like horror for kids. You know, this is when the Goosebumps era came out with R.L. Stein and his books. And it was just a show that had some creepy aspects in it, you know, for a kid, you know, cheese and a lot of cheesiness, but it was entertaining and it's still entertaining. You know, it reminded me of the old Friday the 13th show. I don't know if anybody remembers of that. That's the oldest you know, TV series that was based off the movies, but it really wasn't. They, they kind of felt like it was for kids, and I really enjoyed that to the point. Like even that's the music is iconic. Dark for your dark music, the opening. That yeah, people still talk about till today. But um, those are our picks. Let me know your dump list uh, or your top five uh, at Yumper and Swole, or hit us uh, hit me up at Little Yumper on Twitter. But with that, Swole, let's move on to our news and rumors. So start us off, Mister Swole. So we don't have a lot new in news and rumors um, because the writer strike, there's not a lot of negotiations and deals going on for, for new movies and stuff like that. Um, I do want to talk about a um, little bit of sports stuff in news and rumors. Cause it kind of ties into the movie world. Um, Michael Ower, the, the main character or the, the, the inspiration for the movie, the blind side um, has sued the Tui family um uh for saying that they never really adopted him and it was a conservatorship to c- take control of his money or to use his name to make business deals um and people on twitter and blue sky um and all over the internet are calling for Sandra Bullock to be stripped of her oscar and i just want to talk about how big of a fucking farce that is right sandra bullock had nothing to do with uh this scandal or this lawsuit or this accusation she played a role based on a screenplay and she played it well it was a decent movie um was there um some white savior like storytelling in that movie yes absolutely but she played that role she played it well so did tim mcgraw they he she deserved that oscar and it should not be taken away from her that's just my two cents i don't know how you feel about it yump i think uh if you're calling out Sandra Bullock for playing a fictional character, oh, well, a, a 
professional portrayal of a character for us. And, you know, that was a fucking movie. I think you're an idiot if she didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> right. And that's just my two cents. Like, I think you're stupid for calling out an actor for playing a role. That's like me calling out Amado Asante for playing John Gotti. Oh, you're a fucking asshole. You killed people. Right. He was playing a role and it's not his fault. She did a, a masterful job playing that role in uh, The Blind Side. She should keep her Oscar, leave her alone. But the issue with I see was this uh, disconnection between the family and Michael. Uh, Sean, Chul- Sean Julie actually came out and said that they couldn't adopt Michael legally because he was 18 and they were told a conservatorship would be um, the best thing to do. Now, from reading his statement, he seems like a parent that's really hurt. He said, I will never make money off my kids. And going into it, he actually was, they were millionaires before, you know, Michael Orr became big. I don't know. Maybe Michael's going through some things in his life. I don't know. Um, night, Shane. Uh, thanks for watching, my man. But Love you, Shane. Yeah, it's just something that it's kind of messed up. It ruins a great story, but, you know, we'll never see the, the truth of it from both right. sides. Uh, hopefully they can work it out. And I know this is probably tearing apart their family, especially for somebody they, they helped raise, you know, through most of his life. Uh, but I don't know. It's a jacked up thing in all general. In general, but you know, you did say the writer's strike. In terms of the writer's strike, I found some news that actually a new contract was given to the writers Guild of America, and they are currently in a standstill. Apparently, it was not to the standards of what the writers guild wanted, so they submitted a counter proposal, and that proposal has basically been rejected. And they're kind of, you know, they don't know where they're gonna go from there. So they are still striking. It's the first writers and actors strike in sixty years. Uh, Shout out to friend of the show and site Quarantine for running a little blog about her best Twitter bits of the strike. You can check it out at scientificpenguinstudios.com. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more of that, see little funny aspects of the strike. But it sucks because a lot of movies are put into a standstill right now. And a lot of people aren't getting paid that need to get paid that live off uh, royalties and indemnities uh, from movies. And they're kind of stuck right now because studios don't want to pay. Um, and on top of that, well, so we had some horrible news in the entertainment world in terms of the death of Paul Rubens. Uh, most of us know him as Pee Wee Herman. He unfortunately died at the age of 70 after a bout with cancer that he didn't disclose really to anybody but his close family friends. Uh, everybody loves Paul Rubens as Pee Wee. I loved him as Pee Wee, but Paul Rubens, I think one of my favorite roles is him was as Derek from Blow, the movie with Johnny Depp. Yeah. Uh, Derek LaFell. Derek for real? Yeah, Derek, for real. I think, um, no, every, from everybody came out saying he was such a nice guy. It's sad. Uh, gone too soon. I mean, he was 70, but like 70 still young nowadays, you know, and it just sucks. I, I, it was a real big shockwave through the, the entertainment industry. Um, I actually loved him in mm-hmm. um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yes, Buffy yeah. the Vampire Slayer. The longest death ever. <laughs> <laughs> for a villain you know he was also in batman too he was a penguin's dad he was he was uh, yeah he was oswald cobblepot's father and a lot of people don't know he was in Tilda. he was one of the fbi agents <laughs> that sold uh, yeah that was, it was something a speedboat uh i think like i think his uh, paul rubens uh legacy will always be Pee Wee herman mm-hmm. he was a great like uh, a great actor in his own right and really really talented i think that uh he uh one small little misstep in his career um had kind of like made people a little bit you know but i think paul rubens was was fantastic at what he did yeah totally and he was known for you know peewee's big adventure peewee's playhouse yeah so it's just like a, that still gets a parody to today you know he's uh, so iconic that fucking eminem Put him in one of his songs. In one of his songs, yeah. Yeah, just lose it, like just to make making fun of him. I'm also paying homage. Like Pee Wee's an iconic character, and like it's just sad that he passed away so soon. So you know, R.I.P. to Paul Rubens and condolences to his family and fans. Uh, Agreed. But that's all for news and rumors. Full, unless you got something else that you want to discuss. No, I think that's it. I do. Uh, I think that'll take me into coming soon, and I'll share it with my final thought. So cool. So uh, let's get into our coming soon. And like we discussed before pre-show, uh, we went with a year, pick year of, and we're going to go with 1983 is what the random generator gave us. So in 1983, there are a lot of good films that are out there. So we're going to go with the 10 best, in our opinion, from 1983. 
Uh, that'll be on the next Yumper and Soul, which will probably be, we're probably going to go back to the two week um, schedules. Well, uh, what do you think about that? I think that's great, man. I think the two week schedule is going to be good because I am also doing another podcast with our boy, Bruhan Luke, uh, called From Eugene to Tallahassee, where we talk all things college football. Uh, mm-hmm. So we're really, really excited about that. And Yump is killing it with the way back playback. Um, I know who your yeah. next guest is. I'm not going to share it, but I'm very, very excited for that. Yeah, so uh, I've been doing Wayback Playback, which is like a little side project of basically people coming on, guests coming on and talking about their favorite video games from t- yesteryear. Uh, our first episode was with our buddy Baloney, and then we had um, Zombie Jackie come on from the Ass Crew and Southside Sox. Danny Rocket was gracious to show us uh, show us from the Cub side of um, Ton Ranto podcast, and we had our boy Zoe from Pinwheels and Ivy and Sports Mockery come on and give us his. So I'll still be putting those out as well and um i'm gonna make the announcement now because it is going towards september i will be bringing back 31 days of horror for october so yes one um there'll be a new video every day in october a new horror video with a short synopsis and a couple funny clips that i throw in there so it's gonna be a lot of work but you guys liked that last year i know you and brian have been trying to get me to do it but lonely's actually been asking me to do it again so i'll give you know We'll check you guys and check it out at our YouTube channel. And also, this will shout out to uh, everybody who's been subscribed to our YouTube channel. We don't really push it as you know much as we used should, but we're up to 201 subscribers for a channel that started back in March. That's pretty good. Our views are growing, and we thank you guys so much for you know helping us out and participating. We enjoy everything. Feedback: If you guys have any feedback about anything, let us know. You know, good or bad, we take it in. We try to make the show better. Um, thank you for watching and everything. Uh, yeah, pretty much all I can say. And with that, Swole, let's go into your final thought, my friend. I'm going to continue with this cavalcade of thanks um, because we haven't seen you in um, over a month now. Um, and we had another fantastic Yumper and Swo at the show movie outing uh, July 15th. And I want to thank every single person that showed up, that came and hung out with us to see Indiana Jones uh, and the Dial of Destiny. Um, it was a corny ass movie, but um, it was fun. Um, uh, but we loved hanging out with you guys. We loved the people that went out with us uh, afterwards to uh, Twin Peaks for some uh, completely average food, but some great company. Um, so we're going to continue to do that. Uh, we're going to do another one next year. We just have no idea what the summer blockbuster schedule is going to look like. But that's that's our thing. That's what we love doing. We love doing the Yumper and Spoil movie outing. Because we love talking movies and TV shows. So uh, we'll see you guys in two weeks. Until then, uh, take care of yourselves. Deuces. Oh, also uh, check out um, the Hook Up on Music. It has a new episode dropping soon. So check that out. And uh, Getting Drafted here has some good stuff planned coming soon. So check, be sure to check out the Penguin channel for that. But deuces on that one. Thank you for listening to Yumper and Small. A Sadistic Penguin Studios production. You still here? It's over. Go home. Go.